So hello everyone, my name is Shari Sharma, and my project is going to be on the temporal and spatial characterization of EEG slowing activity types. Just to start off a little bit about me, I attend school at San Juan Hills High School. I'm in Southern California and I'm in the class of 2025. And my project is more related to neuroscience and targeting those areas. And particularly, I'm trying to target the degener degenerative diseases. But to start off our presentation, let's talk a little bit about what is the problem. Oh, so degenerative diseases. So as of 2019, Alzheimer's diseases have amounted a number of deaths of 121,499 individuals, which does seem like a lot. But according to other researchers, in 2060, it seems that we will have 13.8 million people dying of the Alzheimer's diseases. This is not good. These Alzheimer's, dementia, et cetera, we should not have this many people dying of it. And it is definitely a problem that we need to solve today. Otherwise, it's only going to continue onwards from here. And it's only going to plague onwards that we need to stop, definitely. So how do we approach this problem? Well, researchers have been tackling it with a number of different ways. But one way I decided to tackle it was understand a niche concept called EEG slowing. So first, what is EEG slowing? EEG slowing is an indication of abnormal activity, typically noticeable on the electroencephalogram or some type of live recording. EEG slowing can contain a wide variety of states, including a focal, diffuse, triphasic, or even a steady slash basic state. The basic state tends to be found in those that are sleeping or performing basic activities throughout the day. Now, obviously, there's a clear deviation because if you're sleeping, you don't want to be classified as having a destructive EEG slowing tech type, correct? You want to have a normal EEG slowing type versus someone who has Alzheimer's or dementia will have a different EEG slowing type. And as depicted in this picture, it's just a deviation in how the signal will look. But the biggest problem about qualitatively looking at these signals is that even though you may seem a difference, I mean, the signals are very small, right? It's very difficult to see whether the signal is producing one EEG slowing type or another. It's very niche. And sometimes, especially for doctors, it's hard for them to distinguish between, let's say, the steady slash basic state versus perhaps the vocal or diffuse state or another state that's found in Alzheimer's. This can be very problematic, especially if they want to use it for early detection, because these EEG slowing states are actually found in Alzheimer's and dementia. So the biggest problem is being able to determine what, which EEG slowing type is which based off of clear measures. And that's what our problem tackles. Now, why is EEG slowing important? As I mentioned earlier, EEG slowing can also be found as an early detector for degenerative diseases like Alzheimer's or dementia. Especially when it comes to reverse engineering such diseases, perhaps using EEG slowing may help in understanding where the disease stems from, what logistical factors can be accounted for, etc. EEG slowing contains a lot of information, not only in the temporal areas, but also the spatial areas. And using this information for early detection is not a specialized field because it hasn't been experimented much, especially in the research field of neuroscience, but it is definitely one with high value and must be experimented adequately. So the problem, sometimes, as I previously mentioned, it is difficult to determine the different EEG slowing types and determining if there is a quantitative correlation between EEG slowing and specific characteristics will be helpful for early detection and prevention of such diseases. In this study, we primarily focus on the quantitative characteristic of the power spectra density, the PSD, to categorize the different EEG slowing types, especially those that are the most prevalent in degenerative diseases. So what was the approach? First, I began with determining a data set with accurate data of EEG slowing types, both harmful and general. Second, I pre-processed the data using an interactive platform to remove all the data that wasn't relevant to the study and would only deviate the results. Three, I applied machine learning to the end results to categorize the different EEG slowing types based on their respective power spectra density values. And four, I cross-applied the results with raw recordings of EEG data to ensure that the machine learning model is accurate. Now, as I previously mentioned, it's very difficult to determine the different EEG sewing types based off qualitative measures like the shape of the signal. So how exactly did I do this? Well, 
In certain cases, a lot of researchers have found very clear indications of which example is a focal example, which ones are diffuse slowing, etc. So I use those very clear signal types and I compared those with the results that I received from my machine learning analysis to see if my prediction was adequate. I also use other measures to make sure that my machine learning model was predicting what I wanted to based on accuracy scores that I'll explain later. Now, the methods. So I first utilized a public Temple University TUH dataset of EEG slowing, comprising of approximately 27,000 clinical EEG recordings. Data was pre-annotated and the designated labels for which recordings contained slowing and which ones didn't. Types of slowing were not provided. So this was what I had to solve because obviously if the types of slowing were provided, it would be very difficult to determine. It would basically just solve the problem immediately. But because they weren't, I had to tackle that on my own. Two, pre-processing of data occurred using Spider MNE, a variable explorer capable of reading and understanding annotated files and filtering out information including channels, unnecessary timestamps, and breaks in between sessions that signified no important recordings. Now, after sorting all the data into a pandas data frame using the aforementioned programs, I pursued the following different methods of analysis. So one, I used frequency domain analysis, two, time frequency analysis, three, frequency domain clustering, and four, time domain clustering. And essentially, all of them fall under the similar idea because it's basically a time versus frequency plot, and we're using the frequency, which is pretty much correlated with the power spectra density. So whichever values we're getting off of based off time, we're also getting in the power spectra density. And from there, once we get different graphs, we're able to use machine learning on top of that. And as I previously mentioned, lastly, I applied different machine learning algorithms for classification when it comes to these different nodes of analysis, primarily focusing on the power spectra density values. To determine the most accurate machine learning algorithm, the outputted zero to one silhouette score assisted me in determining which algorithm would work best. Now, the question does arise, why did I not use an accuracy calculator to just calculate which accuracy would be higher? Well, unfortunately, given that I didn't have the types of slowing were provided, I wasn't able to create the machine learning algorithm or use accuracy measures to calculate it because those types of labels weren't provided. Therefore, I had to use a different method, which is the silhouette score, which in short, the silhouette score is basically comparing one cluster to another and seeing how accurate it really is. And depending on the zero to one, if it's closer to one, it has the most correlation and is the most accurate. But if it's closer to zero, it's not accurate and therefore it is not adequate for the study. So the different machine learning algorithms I experimented with. I used three different ones. One, k-means, two, umap, and three, tsne. For in short, k-means is an iterative process of assigning each data point to the groups and slowly data points get clustered based on similar features. UMAP, it constructs a high dimensional graph representation of the data, then optimizes a low dimensional graph to be structurally similar as possible. And three, find TSNI, which finds the similarity measures between pairs of instances in higher and lower dimensional space. After that, it tries to optimize two similarity measures. Especially when it comes to the power spectra density in quantitative EEG values, usually UMAP and TSNI are oftentimes used in higher level of research studies because they produce the most accurate results when it comes to these power spectra density values. However, once I tested these different machine learning algorithms, it came apparent that k-means was producing a silhouette score of 0.91, which is very high, in contrast to, let's say, UMAP, which produced a silhouette score of 0.273, which is fairly poor, and TSNI, which surprisingly produced a silhouette score of 0.18, which is very, very poor. Therefore, it seems very logical that k-means would have to work in this study because otherwise we weren't being produced accurate results. And it wasn't producing what we wanted it to. Now the results. Based on the machine learning algorithm, we were able to separate the different EEG recordings into three different segments. The different timestamps that fell into each cluster symbolizes the distinct segments of active EEG slowing. And after determining the timestamps based on the machine learning algorithm, using the power spectra density versus time plot. The recording was displayed in real time to determine the EEG slowing types that were found and if the algorithm truly did find accurate representation of EEG slowing. Example recordings are displayed right here. So as I can explain in the left one, we could see that it has a very huge range in terms of the y-axis, but very quickly squiggles in and then goes back out, which represents a taper in and then 
back out, which that small segment is an EEG sewing, which came under my machine learning algorithm. And then the left one, it's very apparent. It has a very basic slowing line, but then it jumps up immediately, which is an indication of active EEG slowing, followed by a taper out, which is just going back to its regular state. Therefore, in both of these cases, the machine learning algorithm adequately gave me results based on the quantitative measures, and it demonstrates that my machine learning algorithm can, can depict between the different EEG slowing types and be, can be used for early detection. And that wraps up the end of my research study. Thank you, and I'm open to all questions. Hi, thank you so much, Sharia. That was fantastic. And you have quite a few questions as well in the, in the Q&A. So let's see if we can answer a few of them since I know yeah, we yeah. have more presenters to come. Um, so the first question I see here is, um, what next question would you pose to the field to continue this investigation of your research? Absolutely. So obviously EEG slowing is a very wide range, right? It's a very wide topic that can be expanded adequately. The way I did it was I just analyzed one factor, which was quantitative analysis with EEG slowing, which I used the power spectrum density. However, I do believe that there's different ways we can calculate it and make this model more accurate. For example, EEG slowing has a rate. It's the rate of slowing that it goes by. So if we know that in degenerative diseases, there is a certain rate that certain diseases fall under, perhaps we can use more machine learning analysis to be able to determine what is that rate. And if there are other measures we can take to increase that rate so that perhaps that is where these degenerative diseases stem from. And if we increase the rate, perhaps we could remove these degenerative diseases from plaguing onwards. And obviously this is a very theoretical and hypothetical situation, but if that does work as theorized, then perhaps we can advance into the field and maybe make more contributions as follows. Absolutely. Um, and then one more question here. What was the most challenging part of your research project? Yes, yes. So I think the most challenging part of my research project was really understanding the differences between TSNI and UMAP because they're higher level machine learning algorithms and their implications on the power spectra density did pose as a challenge because I did receive a lot of errors when it came to it. And also the application of it was hard to implement. But I believe that in technical terms, it was definitely the hardest to implement. But overall, I think a different problem that posed to me was classifying the different EEG slowing types because knowing which values correlate with which, especially when there's such little margin in the different EEG slowing types does pose as an issue to me because it did take me a lot of time to figure out which slowing types were attributed to my machine learning model. So I think that was the hardest part in determining it. 